welcome to the Work Joy Jam podcast. I'm your host and founder of Create Work Joy, Beth Stallwood. And in this episode, I'm joined by Tom Russell. Tom and I met many years ago when I hired him and his team from Inky Thinking to graphically record a big event for the launch of some values in an organisation I was working with. And I absolutely loved what they did. I loved how engaging it was. And since then, we stayed in touch. I've done some training with him. And I think this whole thing around using graphics and imagery and drawing to help engage ourselves and other people in meetings, in events, in workshops is really powerful. And for me, it gives me loads of work joy. So I was so pleased that Tom agreed to come on and talk to me and talk to us a little bit more around this thing called graphic recording. Now you may be really into it already. You may have never heard of it before. And I hope it gives you a bit of an overview. It also has some amazing practical tips in there. And I will pop on at the end and share with you some of the things that I have really taken away Away from my conversation with Tom. Here it is. Welcome to the Work Joy Jam. Today I'm super excited to be joined by Tom Russell and to talk a little bit about some of the things that we can do to help to bring some joy into our lives, perhaps through things that are visual, things that we draw, things that we look at. And I am so keen to have this conversation. It's an area I love to be in and I think it can really help us all. So rather than me introduce Tom, I'm going to hand over to Tom to say hi, to introduce yourself. And why don't you tell us a little bit about your story and how you got to where you are today? Thanks, Beth. It's uh, it's super exciting to be here, and uh, I've been watching and listening to to the WorkJoy activities for a while, and listening to the podcast. So it's it's super exciting just to be sitting in the chair talking to you. Um, my story is that I'm the founder and co-director of Inky Thinking, uh, often called Inky Fingers or lots of other different <laughs> iterations, but Inky Thinking is the name. We are visual communication specialists and uh, we work with a variety of businesses, typically B2B, commercial organizations, and the type of visual work we uh, get involved in is graphic recording, uh, both live graphic recording for face-to-face meetings and conferences and digital. We create um, explainer animations, create rich pictures for organizations for culture and strategy programs and customer experience maps and a whole host of other things. And we also uh, train on this work as well. And of course, you'll know that because you've been on one of our I Inky have. Jam courses in the past, which we remember fondly. Um, my story is that my background is in human resources. Uh, I was in human resources for about 15 years before I went into the world of facilitation and then working in graphics. And uh, the point at which I got into this was that my boss at the time said, uh, why don't you hire a graphic recorder for this meeting that you're running? And it was a recruitment meeting. And I hadn't really heard of this, Beth, at the time. I just thought, "Mm, okay, what's that all about? So she knew somebody who came in and that person graphically captured this meeting that we were in at the time. And I can remember not really paying an awful lot of attention to what we were talking about. In fact, I don't really (laughs) recall any of it. But I can remember this lady just doing this wonderful job and I'm thinking whoa that is such a cool job I would so love to do that and it went from there and maybe I'm a bit fortunate because my parents although they retired retired now were graphic uh, were graphic designers Ah, and artists and they still are so even and they used to be uh, self-employed and working in an office at home and I used to go up and pinch the pens and the paper when I was younger much to their displeasure (laughs) so maybe there's a bit of artistic in me yeah through genes rather than training i love that so maybe like by osmosis all this artistic and graphic talent has come through to you even if it wasn't something you explored as a job to start with and yes definitely one it was one of my favorite training days i've ever been on and i say that absolutely genuinely not just because you are on uh, the podcast today (laughs) so number one as you know and as many people who listen to the podcast uh, and follow me and create work joy on all the socials, I 
am obsessed with stationery. So for me, <laughs> the idea that you were going up to your parents' study and finding pens and paper, that's exactly what I did as a child with my mum who worked from home. I used to get obsessed with like the stationery um, catalogue that she had mm. and totally love it. And I, it's interesting, so we're going to go into some of these things, but I personally for many years thought and said the words out loud a lot to myself, as I'm sure many, many people do, um, I can't draw. I always thought I was bad at art. I thought it was something I wasn't good at. So I didn't really explore it very much. And hmm. when I hired, so when I, I worked in an organization, the way, way I met Tom was to actually through uh, the Inky Thinking and hiring um, Inky Thinking to do some graphic recording of a big launch event that we did. And from there, I was completely obsessed with the idea of it and obviously then went on to the training. And what I would say now is that I can use drawing and art and you know, whatever you would call it to help with stuff. So I think it's brilliant and I want to explore it a bit more. And I do think that a lot of our audience will never have heard of a graphic recorder or that kind of stuff. So hmm. can you dive in a little bit for us and explain what happens if you do graphic recorder meeting? What's the process and why is it a really good thing to have? Sure. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you're in good company when it comes to stationery and pens here, of course. Yeah, so it's okay to be to, to confess your stationary um, sins on this podcast. The graphic recording technique is something that emerged during the probably the late 1990s, predominantly from the West Coast of the States. And uh, essentially, it's the, it's the synthesis of the conversation that occurs in a meeting or a conference or an event. Uh, and that gets filtered and created graphically in words and icons and graphics onto a, typically a very large paper chart so that participants in that meeting can see it emerge during the course of the conversation. It's a great tool for facilitators because you can refer to it and you can orientate the group to it at different points in the uh, conversation as well. And it provides a really useful, engaging visual record of the meeting as opposed to uh, you know, sort of minutes that might be text-based and people might receive them but not necessarily look at. Yeah. So it's an artifact, if you like. And, of course, with um, COVID and people working at home, that graphic recording work has uh, been um, – has, has moved to digital uh, working virtually uh, as, the, as the default way of doing it, certainly over the, the last year, year and a half. Mm. Amazing. And having been there and experienced it and see it come to life, and I'm sure people can go and look at this kind of stuff on your website as well to see, you know, examples and where it comes from, is seeing that kind of thing come to life is, I found it massively inspiring. I found it way mm -hmm. more interesting and especially yeah. in an important new thing, something that you really want to get people engaged with. Yeah you know, having that graphic, having it in a way that you can then use it and refer to it was a really incredible thing. And you're absolutely right. So I'm going to do a massive confession now. I'm not a big fan of minutes. I'll say it out there. Um, Rereading what people have said and the action points and things like that are not on my list of favorite things to do. That would mm. not bring me personally some work joy. Um, Yet, if someone gave me something visual to look at, something there, I think I would want to look at it again. There's definitely yes. something different in the way that that plays with my brain. And I can you tell us a little bit more about when you've when you've been doing this work, and obviously you've been doing it for many years now. What do you think is it that makes a difference for people? How does it engage people in a different way to more traditional mm. notes and things? Yeah, okay. And, and just before I answer that question, I mean, you touched on this earlier, in that, you know, we're, we are all visual people. Everyone on the planet is wired to think visually to some extent. Yeah. You know, if we weren't visual people, we would find it very hard to navigate the world, you know, just driving, for example, and all the road signs that we see, the majority of which are our icons, essentially, you know, if we didn't, if we weren't visual people, we would find it very difficult to live, wouldn't be a very pleasant experience. But of course, some people are more visual than others, you know, the same way as that I'm, I'm not particularly strong with numbers, but I'm more, I'm stronger with, uh, with visual creativity, you know, we're all, we're all different. Um, so in terms of the benefits of graphic recording, well, there are a number of things. First of all, it creates 
shared meaning and shared understanding. So if if I'm in a in a room and you're leading a meeting with um, participants, they will be able to see the key points of that uh, conversation appear on the chart, and they'll be able to make links between different points. So you, without sounding too cheesy, you're literally seeing the bigger picture emerge <laughs> on the chart. And it yeah. does sound cheesy, but it's true. Um, and it helps getting the thinking out onto a, a chart or on a screen, whatever it might be, it helps people to process it because it's very difficult to process somebody else's thinking. And if that thinking is is out somewhere on post-its on a chart, then that, that makes the job much easier to do. Um, and it inspires commitment to action, as well as making uh, the likelihood of recall a lot stronger. Yeah. Love that. Uh, and <laughs> I think this might be from the training now, but I actually have a tendency to do it. So I will tell you, I'll do a little confession now is I have literally just drawn a block of cheese um, <laughs> on my notes that I'm making right. here about the podcast okay. and yeah. colored it in with a yellow highlighter. Um, and it's it's one of those pieces of cheese with lots of holes in it. So I think it's probably an Emmental or something like that. Nice. Um, it's not perfect. It's really messy. But it's making me remember, even just by doing that, I'm, I, I know that I'll remember that we talked about the cheesy bit as being about the bigger picture. So yeah. I, I can I can really feel it happening. And yeah. I, I wonder, so it's obviously, I am all for this. So I'm a big fan of you and your work and Inky Thinking and how it all comes together. And uh, one thing I haven't seen yet, and I, I'm really excited to do it at some point, is this coming to life in the digital world, because mm. I think that's so important with things like Zoom fatigue, or mm. I probably shouldn't say Zoom, we shouldn't advertise it, should we? But um, <laughs> with, with the fatigue of being online a lot, yeah. I imagine that suddenly coming into a session where you've got something being graphically recorded or graf graphically displayed in some way would feel really different to the very average meeting. Yeah, I think it, it yes, you're right, it does. Uh, although from a from a from a subject matter expertise point of view, graphic recording digitally is a very different beast to yeah. doing it in person. So technically it requires a slightly different skill set because you know, I, when when you and your participants are talking in that meeting we mentioned earlier, it's going in my ear, being processed in my brain, then goes out down my arm and it comes out through my hand and the pen onto a chart. With digital graphic recording, technology means there are you know, different things you have to bear in mind in terms of layers and choices of colours. And it's not as simple yeah. as just picking up one pen and swapping it over. So quite often that gets ignored and understandably so because if quite often clients uh, believe that if you can graphically record on a piece of paper you can quite equally do it uh, digitally and it doesn't all that isn't always the case but it's just a, a there are some different considerations i guess also because virtual meetings are very different things to face to face meetings in a face to face meeting participants often come up and engage with the graphic recorder come and take photos of the image uh, and it's a focus point of conversation that happens probably less so in a virtual meeting um, because we're just not able to go up to it and, and interact with it as much and of course the design of a virtual meeting comes first so you can still have a quite a, a uh what's the word uh, adding graphic recording to a virtual meeting doesn't necessarily make it a automatically more enjoyable meeting if you get the chips <laughs> yeah, yeah it might make it more more distracting for example or it's an additional element but it's not it doesn't take a meeting from being conventional or maybe dull to being one that's interesting and engaging automatically yeah so that's that's a really interesting point and maybe we can dive into that a bit is that just having the recording there isn't the thing that makes it necessarily more engaging, but it can be something that enhances an already engaging, interesting subject yeah. with whatever you're talking absolutely. about. It's not a magic cure for a terrible meeting. No. Absolutely. No, quite right. Love that. Mm. <laughs> because I imagine there's some people um, on the line now going, oh, I have to sit through loads of terrible meetings. Could I just do this and get, you know, get somebody in to make it, <laughs> make it better just by recording it? Probably not going to be the thing, but um using it in an already interesting maybe tough difficult subject or something you need to get out there something you need people to engage with to help it take it to the next level versus mm. going from it being terrible to being okay 
Yeah, absolutely. And we, we're often asked to come in and graphic record meetings on complex subjects or subjects which might seem a little on the dry side. And then you've got a, a, a very diverse audience, some of whom are, you know, might be attracted by the emotional element of it, others who may be more linear and uh, interested in sort of the process aspects. And what graphic recording does, and it uses words, text, as well as graphics, is brings that all together so that it appeals to a, a diverse range of thinking and learning styles. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a really good point. And let's talk about that for a minute, because when you have got diverse audiences when you have got different people which you always have in a room right no one is ever exactly the same in how they think and how they learn um how does this really help from that aspect to help people to understand if it is complex or if it is a subject they're not sure about or any of those things you you, you know you said they're about text and images and stuff how Hmm. does it really help with those different learning and engaging styles well, I guess at a, at, a, at a very basic level, you've got some of us who are much more attracted to graphics and icons and, and you know, uh, graphic visual stimulus. Others are more attracted to text and words. So, for example, you said earlier that if you receive some meeting minutes uh, after a, a meeting, you're less likely to to want to read those, but others might be more inclined to read those. So you're appealing to a broad audience um, by including text and, and graphics in the uh in the final image um also when we're graphic re- graphically recording we're not capturing everything you know, if we were to capture everything verbatim uh, one it would be an extremely large graphic and you'd have a really <laughs> really tired graphic recorder at the same time but what we are doing is listening for cues so in a conversation there might be something that gets particularly focused on by the group it could be something that arouses particular you know uh, conversation it could even be something that's a bit controversial Uh, or for example presenters are reinforcing particular points so what we're doing is capturing key parts of the conversation but Recall is such that if we capture, you know, say, for example, say 20 key elements of, a, of, a, of an important conversation and we do it in a, in a way that shows the flow, participants would be able to remember broadly what happened between those key points and around those. So it's, it's, it's a prompt, if you like, a memory mm-hmm. prompt too, to help people understand the, the, the larger conversation. And we find a lot of clients then take the graphic output and share it with people who weren't in the session let's say you might do it in a in a board meeting or in a senior leadership meeting and of course you can't get everybody in that conversation but then it can be taken out by various participants and and briefed to their teams and and using the graphic as a way of doing that so it it helps them recall uh, more than what's simply on the chart I'm really loving that. And I've, I've kind of in my head and actually on my piece of paper, I've drawn like a big funnel thing, which for me is like all of this information is a lot and you can't, I like, I imagine you can't record it all because it just would not be possible. So it's yeah. almost like the recorder is like the filter and the identifier mm. of the key points. And then yeah. it's putting those key points in a way that as many people as possible in different ways can actually understand and engage with and take away and remember. Absolutely. Yeah. Listening is the number one skill. Um, you know, some some people might suggest it's illustrative, illustrative skill, and that's important. But uh, maybe as we'll touch on later, you, know, you don't necessarily have to be a fine artist to to be a graphic recorder. But listening is the primary yeah. uh, skill that one needs in order to identify what's most important. I have so many questions for you and uh, I'm going to go down a few different routes if it's okay. The first route I really want to go down because I I was going to say it earlier, but then we got into the conversation, but I then got really excited about it, is from HR to graphic recording as a career move. And lots of the people who listen to the podcast are always really fascinated by people's career moves and what they do. And it's not necessarily one I've ever heard of before, which is where it gets exciting. When you said, obviously, you got inspired by seeing this happening, what was the mm. route to actually doing it and running a business doing it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I 
I did some research after I'd been in this meeting I referred to earlier, and um, I, I, I just invested in some personal development and took myself off to San Francisco, which is not a, not a bad place to go when it comes to training. I was going to um, say, that's pretty nice. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So I went off to San Francisco, I think around 2009, to the Grove, which some listeners may be aware of. It's a, a place where there are uh, there's lots of great thinking around graphic facilitation and using visual imagery in group process. And David Sibbett is the founder of the Grove. So I, I went there for a week. I did uh, went through the graphic facilitation course. Um, I, I, I guess I've got some artistic knowledge and tendency there from maybe just from the family and so then I I hadn't quite left my uh, employer at the time so I had a go in in a couple of meetings I put my hand up and said look you know this this is something I'm learning about and w- it was quite transparent and open about what I wanted to do and I'd been in HR for some time and it, you know a change was was due and so they agreed for me to capture a couple of those meetings just just to give it a go and because i'd look back at those now and think gosh that's absolutely horrendous graphically but it proved to be one useful for them and it was extremely useful for me and then it kind of opened my eyes to what was possible and then i went to uh, uh, and worked in a, an organization that specializes in facilitation and graphics and so it just morphed and continued and uh that's led to where I am now. It's amazing. And one thing I'm always talking about when it comes to careers is that we never know all of the jobs that are out there. And every Mm. day I speak to new people and get absolutely fascinated with what they do. And Mm. until that moment in time, you had no idea that this job was there, that there was something called a graphic record and you went and got inspired. And now that's your career and your business. And I I find that amazing. And I just really encourage all of our listeners to just keep your eyes out and be aware of stuff. And when you get excited about something, do that research, explore it, see where it might take you, put yourself on some personal development like you did. I mean, I now want to go to San Francisco and go and do that course. So good sales (laughs) pitch for you. Um, Just because, you know, San Francisco and learning and development and getting to draw on stuff. I mean, how much fun would that be? Exactly. What's not to like about that? I mean, some people would find that probably their own version of absolutely awful but for me that would be a lot of work joy Mm. um so i I think that is just a real key point is you do not know all the options that are out there the careers advice we had at school did not tell us that there was a job as a graphic recorder it didn't tell us that there were these things that were possible so uh, i just think i love that and thank you so much for sharing it because it's lovely to hear how different careers happen Mm. the next route i want to go down if you're happy to head down it is so graphic recording great thing really engaging helps people to filter it helps people to remember what's going on um, appeals to lots of different learning styles so that's great and you know people now know who to get in touch with you if they're looking for a graphic recorder for an yeah. event or a meeting or something they want to work through what i'd love to do now if we can is to take it from the organizational let's make this happen to the individual side of things so I might be out there as one of the listeners and I'm listening to this and going oh that sounds really interesting how does that relate to what I could do as an individual maybe I'm a leader of a meeting maybe I'm facilitating something maybe I'm a participant of a meeting is there anything that we can take from graphic recording that we could then use every day rather than it being something that we have to always hire somebody in to do Absolutely. I mean, everybody can take something from this way of working and apply it in in different aspects of their lives. It doesn't have to be work related. It can be personal uh, for personal benefit as well. So, for example, there's been a huge uh, surge in interest in visual note taking just on a personal basis. So when people are in conferences or meetings, for example, um, rather than just taking you know straight text notes, um, there's been a, a trend towards people just trying something different, incorporating visual icons and images within the, the text, for example, to, to help make it more easy to remember. And not just working with icons, but also structuring the notes differently. So you know, people find different ways of structuring their notes, but the most common is to, to create it like a narrative or a list. 
using a structure like a mind map or a spidergram, as it's often called, could be a different way of doing it. There are different ways of structuring your notes or adding additional value to your notes, which some people may think is just doodling, um, but is actually serving a purpose. So, Beth, I am sure that somewhere you have got posh notebooks that you've seen on your <laughs> travels you know the shop beginning with m where they sell nice posh notebooks although others are available where yeah. you thought i really you want to use that to take notes and then what's happened you've got it home you think i can't possibly soil it with my my writing or my my doodles i'm going to put it in a cupboard somewhere because i can't bring myself and yeah. then the process repeats and you might find that you've got more than one and i've been there as well <laughs> i am currently sat next to my notebook stash and the top shelf is the two nice to use ones the middle shelf is the nice for important things that you actually are going to use <laughs> and the bottom shelf is every day for any old rubbish that is actually how my <laughs> notebook shelves are it's a whole shelf it is it is, a, it is wow. an important thing so i do have that and yeah i'm looking at them laughing at your comment here so go down this route for me because maybe yeah. i'll go and, maybe i'll grab one and start writing in one who knows yeah go That's for it well, well, I mean, it taps off to you because I've never heard of anyone who's actually got a set of shelves for these unused notebooks. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. I think, yeah, I think that that's almost bordering on on a problem, maybe. But anyway, <laughs> so I'm sure that many of us have got one of these notebooks. And so my challenge is just to grab it and start using it. And, you know, it's, it's almost like feeling the fear and, and try it anyway. And turn it, if, you, if you're used to taking notes in portrait, turn it landscape and and try something uh, try a different perspective start from the middle and work outwards when you're taking notes for example just add small and simple icons that help you capture quickly or remember parts of the conversation you're having um you know it, it can be your own place to take notes other people don't have to see it and uh, you know, if if you have a posh notebook, you know, use a flash pen with it as well, you know, and treat yourself. It, this is something that needs to be enjoyable. And we wouldn't enjoy it if we were probably doing it on a rough old notebook with a, a cheapy biro, for example. Um, but you can do it however you like. So on a participant level, because you talked about leaders, facilitators and participants or individuals, that's a great way of starting. And if if you don't necessarily get the chance to do it in a work meeting or those kind of conversations don't come across a lot, even just listening to the radio or watching telly is a good way of just sitting down with a piece of paper and just try and draw or note take what you are hearing. The news is a great place because there are so many different stories and different subjects. And uh, it, it's if you find a particular topic interesting, something say on a TED talk even that you think do you know what I've been meaning to listen to that because that just has piqued my attention then get the notebook out and see if you can capture it as well such a good idea and I've written down these things because and I've written it down with a picture of a book next to it I've drawn a picture of a book cool. I recognize it as a book whether anyone else would and I'm going to come yeah. on to that point in a minute so turn it landscape so get get your good book and start using it Okay, I'm going to do yes. it. I'm going to grab one of my good books. I am, use it in a way that's not typical to how you yeah. might use a notebook. So I, I can, I just, like, yeah, can. can I just mention one more thing? I want to go back to your piece of cheese, mm. that Emmental cheese or whatever it was that you've, um, you've drawn and coloured in. And there are three, if you imagine that piece of cheese in three, in three slices, three parts, the first one is, uh, we'll call it draw. OK, so that's when you just you scribble something down. You think, OK, I'm thinking of a notebook or I'm thinking of a piece yeah. of cheese or whatever it might be. And that's when you draw it. The second one is accept. So you accept that that is the little icon or graphic of a notebook or a piece of cheese that you've drawn. And to you, that's a piece of cheese or a notebook. And it may not be the most artistically uh, outstanding version of a notebook or a piece of cheese. But you know what? It serves a purpose. So the third part of that cheese is move on. And that's something that graphic recorders and visual note takers need to work with is that you need to draw, accept and move on. Because if you get hung up on the quality of your, uh, your icons or your graphics, you'll just you, you, you'll lose the train of the conversation. 
for example. And that can be quite hard to do initially. But if you draw, accept and move on and keep working on that basis, it can really help with just, it, just tacitly improving your visual practice, however you do it. I love that. Um, I, I'm just like slightly blown away by the idea of it as well, because it's it, my brain is firing in many different angles for mm. that. Just draw it. Don't think about it. Draw it, accept yeah. it, and then move on to the next thing. Don't overthink it. And I'm loving all the ideas of how you do like turn it landscape, you know, start from the middle, use some nice pens. I mean, I don't need an excuse to buy new pens, obviously, no. but I could go and no get the, I could get the nice ones out, like the special ones in the special pencil case, using those icons. But one thing I'm just thinking about with what you said there about the draw, except move on, mm. the DAM method, you might call it, DAM. Oh, right. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Take that if you'd like it. Um, is I, I'm, I'm going to go slightly out there beyond what we're talking about, and then I'll bring it back. Mm. Bear with me while I do this. Many of the people who listen to this podcast and many of the people that I work with in groups or on one-to-one really struggle with things that aren't perfect, with themselves not being able to do everything in exactly the right way. And what I'm wondering here is whether there is a real connection and a practice that we could do using this kind of skill, using this method. It doesn't even need to be a skill, does it? It's just doing it anyway, about being a real lesson and being okay with our own imperfection. Yeah. Gosh, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I've just gone like, and I know I've gone completely like out there. You've gone rogue, haven't you? Completely. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Here's, I'm not sure if this is entirely a- answering your question. So you talked about facilitators or or being in a meeting context. Yeah. Let's Let's say that somebody in the group and it could be somebody on this podcast, or listening to this podcast, agrees to take some visual notes. Now, that might be visual notes just in a notepad, or it might even be on a flip chart. But that's quite a an exposing thing to do. And I think uh, quite a lot of people are reluctant to be the person who stands at the flip chart taking notes because you're on show, and it um, feels a bit lonely. But I think the big barrier is, the thought of what might people might say if they saw your notes and if you're worried about your piece of cheese or your little notepad icons then maybe there's a worry that others will look at them and think what's that or or laugh and actually it's really okay because i i would guarantee that if people started um taking notes visually and sharing those outputs with others they would find that people are really receptive to it, much more receptive to to what people what you would might might imagine, uh, and that's that really is pushing the comfort zone out. Um, but you know we don't learn unless we're right at our learning edge anyway. So it's a it's a way of getting feedback and and recognition for the work done, and also you know just a, a chance to hear what other people have to say about it. Yeah, and that that thing about you might be worried about it but everyone else just might be really interested in it or be really um happy that you've done it in that way or really interested in it yeah so we all we always don't we we always think about the worst case scenario versus the best case scenario Mm. and actually the best case scenario is that you've really helped somebody else but with your drawing or with what you've done in terms of your notes and yeah and you're so right the edge of the comfort zone is where the growth happens and you have Mm. to get uncomfortable to start with and I love that. And I, I think maybe what I'll do is I, because I'm squiggling drawings as we're going through this, I might in a version of actually just get it out there and see what happens. I'm going to take a mm-hmm. picture of some of these drawings and put them on the Instagram and stuff when we put this podcast out there, because I mm-hmm. I am happy to say that I have slightly got past the, it has to be perfect stuff when I am facilitating or doing stuff and it just has to be there. Just get it done, yes. get it out there. And also, here's the other thing I've noticed, and I don't know if you've noticed this as well, is sometimes a little bit of laugh about how my drawing is a re- is a real kind of bonder and um, something that just really helps people get engaged with it and realise that it's okay to say stuff that they might not have wanted to say before. Because if my drawing yeah. isn't perfect, they can have an imperfect point or an imperfect question as Absolutely. well. Yes. Yeah. Well, like you said, we're full of imperfections and that's okay. Um, and what we scribble and draw is just another element of that. 
Um, and, you know, e even if, for example, you're taking notes and you share those notes with others and there's a bit of a chuckle around an element that you've drawn, it makes it more memorable. And it also breaks down barriers and creates more of a sense of trust and community. So in the end, it's a great thing. Great. So talk to me a little bit more about, so we've talked about as an individual, you can like grab a notepad, start using it, turn it landscape, do some of these things for different things, listen to the news, watch some telly and just start that practicing of it and see where it leads you. Mm -hmm. For those people who are listening, who are in a position of being the leader of a meeting or the facilitator of a meeting, what are some of the things that people might want to think about to help them in their worlds? Okay, so the first thing to say is that it doesn't necessarily follow that the leader or the facilitator of the meeting is the person who needs to graphically capture it. Yeah. In many cases, it's uh, uh, recommended that somebody else does it. So there's a scribe or one of the meeting participants agrees to do that. Or you even get a graphic recorder in to do that, dare I say it. But the reason for saying that is when a facilitator is leading the group, really they need to be focused on the group and how the group are working towards the outcomes that have been achieved and uh, it, it can it can form quite a, a juggling act yeah. to be able to lead facilitate and uh, serve the group and capture at the same time having said that however if that's just not possible then put in a bit of time before the meeting and create some templates so if you're going to for example, have a conversation about um, the, the the business plan for the next twelve months. For example, it's a little cliched, but you know, create a, a visual journey map. You know, from left to right on a big uh, sheet of paper, or put some flip charts together on a wall. And then create, then you've got a big sheet. You know, and have a path from A to B. You know, embellish it with things that are typical to your own organisation, for example, and you could capture on that as the conversation progresses, or as I said earlier, you could get someone else or even the group to capture it. But you're putting in a bit of time and effort up front, which makes capturing in the meeting a lot easier and more visibly, uh, visibly eye-catching and engaging. I love that idea of the prep in advance and getting some templates or something up there that you can then work through using the right thing so is it a big long map that you want to do or is it a flip chart of something mm. um, and also then making your life easier by having them done in advance so you're not trying to create them whilst you're also trying to think and you're trying to listen because yeah. as you said like I'm coming back to it the most important thing and you'd be surprised I and mean, I know you've listened to some of them how much listening comes up as the most important thing around mm. um, work and joy and things like that is that listening piece if you are trying to concentrate on something else I imagine could be really hard especially when you first start doing this absolutely and there are lots of little hacks you know for example um I always uh I always um advise against using yellow on flip charts because it's blooming hard to read but if you've got a pale yellow pen and you're the leader of the meeting by and large you could put something on a chart, maybe even be a little icon or a star or whatever, because I am rubbish at drawing stars. They <laughs> they just go completely wrong. But if you draw it in a pale yellow pen on the chart, your participants generally won't be able to see it, but then you can follow it um, with your dark pen at the time. And hey, presto, you've just driven a, drawn a magnificent star and uh, you'll be, you know, you'll be, you know, what's the word, respected for it. Yeah. But it's just a little example of something you can do to make your life as a meeting facilitator a bit easier but really participants for participants it, it, it adds real value I love that so you're actually slightly cheating because you've done something in advance and you've made yourself look amazing in the session when actually you could have looked awful because you can't draw a star I'm I'm totally now thinking Tom just to set you up here the next time that you're graphically recording something for me I'm totally going to make sure there's some kind of star in it just to see how <laughs> good or bad the stars are <laughs> uh, yeah well okay I'll, I'll I'll be ready for that one be ready for it. you have to do some practice to get a going and I also love the advice there thinking around um just because you're the leader of the meeting doesn't mean you have to do the graphic work sometimes it's in fact most of the time it might be better to have somebody else and yes. maybe that's something around getting somebody in a professional maybe it's something about having a, a little team of people in your workplace who you help each other out so you say do you want me to come and be your flip chart person yes. um 
to help you on that if you'll come and help me for this and having that sort of reciprocal arrangement because yes. you are right doing all of those things at the same time facilitating listening drawing etc that's a lot for one brain to handle yes absolutely well do you know it's funny you say that um we have done quite a lot of work with a housing association down in the southwest uh and they're an absolutely super group of people so passionate about what they do and they have their own team of inky thinkers in in the organization who do just that so we've uh, taken them through a, a one-day workshop on the basics of graphic recording uh, they've got some great practice got on the pens got used to the kit and equipment and so on and uh, now they do just that for each other's meetings they're a, they're a pool like a central resource to be called upon for any kind of meeting and they love it. And it's just so wonderful to see them flourish and just use that technique internally. I love that. And the fact that you're saying that, I, I imagine some people think, oh, I, I don't have the resources to go to San Francisco for a week to learn this stuff and the time. But a one day course can enable people to take this into their organizations and do stuff with it. Yeah, followed by a real commitment to practice, absolutely. Yeah. But actually, practice in real life is the best thing, right? Get out there, do it. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, I am so excited by all of this. As many people can tell, I get lots of work joy from the things that you're talking about, about graphics and using imagery and getting people to get icons and a lot of my notes. And actually, where I'm sat here, on one side, I've got my um, my unused notepads. So... Okay. You know, it may be a problem. On the other side of me, I have what's called best big plan for the next four years. What do I want to do? Kind of some goals, etc. And it is a combination. I've just noticed this and I'm like, ah, I'm laughing at it. Every single thing that has like a section or a note on it also has an image that goes with it. And I, I didn't even consider that that was how I was going to write it. It's just how I do things now mm. after um, being on some training with you with the inky jam etc and just really loving the way i do it um so yeah it's really interesting what it can do and how it can spark some stuff in your brain and that practice bit is just try it out give it a go mm, uh, you know yeah. get one of those notepads and you know for me obviously any excuse to go to a lovely stationery shop to go and <laughs> buy a new notepad i don't need to buy any more obviously to get some nice pens um i like a combination of colored and some nice black for the wording that's my personal um nice. preference but i like a chunky pen like a, a good chunky pen and some highlighters all of that kind of stuff so i think cool. I, this has been amazing and i could talk to you probably for the rest of the week um about all these different things um but what i'd love to do now if it's okay with you is to move on to some quick fire questions as we finish okay. off so first one, um, let's bring it back to some work joy for a moment. And I would love to know from you as a person who is out there in the world of work, what is guaranteed to always bring you some work joy? I love working with the Inky Thinking team. The, we, we're, a, we're a virtual team, um, but we're a close team. And my I get joy from having contact with the team every day and yeah. helping them to grow and learn and also for you know for, for it to be a very much a two-way learning process so you know none of us have the monopoly on all the knowledge and and skills but if there is a you know if there's a day when I've helped somebody else to grow and they've helped me to grow as a person then that's a good day so that um, brings me joy, that constant learning, but just learning from each other because we all have such different experiences and perspectives. I love it. And that whole idea that it's, it's both ways. I love it. Getting two, two way learning in. Um, right. Next question. What book are you currently reading? Well, do you know, I've dug out one recently that's been around for a while and it's called The Trusted Advisor by uh, David Meister and uh, it is a bit of an old book but do you know what I think it's actually quite um, quite a classic in the sense that it, it's about how one develops a, you know, a trusted peer-to-peer -peer, uh, advisor relationship with your clients and what that means in terms of the characteristics of that relationship uh, and how it can grow and trust is such an important element of any relationship whether it's a work relationship or a personal one and i'm talking about this in the context of work of course um but i sometimes i find that books i've read in the past are really good to just 
dip back in on and just ask myself the question, am I still doing what I said I would do as a result of, of reading this mm. book? So I'm, I'm revisiting that one right now. I'll probably go on to uh, something a little bit more recent after that, but that's yeah. my current read I love that actually sometimes I think revisiting things and I sometimes do it I don't know if you do where if I've read something on a book I then listen to it and I gather something different listening to it so sometimes just changing the the format in which you do it can be really great so the trust advisor we will pop that on to the show notes um question three this is an interesting one um what is the best or most useful bit of advice that you've had that you always find yourself coming back to? Oh, okay. Yeah, this is going to be easy. So somebody said to me, you can live with decision, but not with indecision. And I've come back to that one so much, both, you know, work and personal life as well. And it's great because, you know, Sometimes we have to make some really important decisions in life and other times we make lots of small ones. But, you know, if I find that if you go with a decision, the best decision you can possibly make at the time, then that is that is action. That's that's moving forward. There's a, somebody who um, I know very well who always advises us on a business perspective not to drift. Um, and so, if, you know, if, you, if you're working and making decisions, then you are moving on. Sometimes you may look back on that and think maybe that wasn't the best decision, but at least you made one and you took action to, to try something new or try something different or improve whatever you're doing. That's an absolutely brilliant bit of advice. I love that. I'm going to take that um, hmm. and consider it because so many of us, we do get stuck, don't we, in that analysis paralysis situation where there are there are so many different options in the world right now, things that we could do, where we could go. And sometimes we just don't take action because it's too hard to think about what action to take. So just take something, make a decision, go with it, do your best job with it and see where it goes. Love yeah, it. Really absolutely. great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Um, next one. What's one super practical bit of advice? And you've given loads already, but, it's, you know, think about this one that you could give to our listeners, which is something they could go and do almost right now, today, tomorrow, that might help them engage with some visual stuff in a little bit more detail. OK, so so I suggested the practice earlier yeah. on. So listening to something different or watching a program and taking notes. One thing that I find gives me work joy is to not only uh change the perspective say on the page for example and try capturing something differently but also doing it in a place that's different so i appreciate that not everyone listening to the podcast for example if they work in an office uh on a on a daily basis might may have that choice but if you can go somewhere different could be a coffee shop could be a park whatever the weather's doing it it it's somewhere where your perspective is and your environment is completely different to the office or the desk and so you're just completely refreshing your uh, perspective and your environment in order to do something that should be refreshing and enjoyable as well. So just try doing it in different places. Such great advice. And like just giving yourself that space. And I think we can all do that, even if it's, you know, even people are working in an office or not in an office in a hospital or wherever else people, you know, end up working in a shop, et cetera, is, I talk about quite a lot about reclaim your lunch break is go and do something like that on your lunch break. You know, if you're, if it's the summer and you can go and sit outside and listen to a podcast and make some notes about it, if you can go and go for a walk while you're doing, there are so many different things that you can do, but getting a bit of a change of perspective would be really great. So love that. Great. Thank you. And before we finish off, please do tell our audience where they can find out more about you and about Inky Thinking and about your world in graphic recording and all the other amazing things that you do. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. So if uh, listeners are interested in finding out about me and the Inky Thinking team, then inkythinking.com is where we are. That's our website. You'll find lots of examples there of our work, whether it's graphic recording, as we've talked about. We've got some animations on there as well, customer experience mapping, all, all a, a nice big range of, uh, of the work there. We've also got our blog, which is called Inkblot. And uh, there were not only do myself and members of the team contribute our thinking and insights there, we've got some practical stuff and some product reviews. Um, some uh, we, Maybe we should do some reviews of some nice notepads as well. I hadn't thought about mm, that until that's now. That's a great one. Do you want me to help with that? <laughs> 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think you'd be first in the queue. And we've also got some guest <laughs> bloggers on there as well. Um, you will know that yourself. Um, I will. Uh, absolutely. So that's the place to go. We're on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube for the animated elements as well. So we're, we're on all the socials or most of them. And please Brilliant. do come uh, to our website and you can contact us via the website as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for being a guest, for sharing your uh, amazing thinking around everything inky. I turned it the other way around on that little one there. Uh, It's been great to talk to you and I look forward to talking to you again soon. It's been a pleasure, Beth. Thank you very much. Looking forward to speaking with you again and seeing your scribbles in your notebooks. (laughs) You will definitely see them. I'll put them out there. Great. Well, a huge thank you to Tom for coming on the podcast and for talking us through everything to do with graphic recording. There are so many things that I am taking away and so many things that I've learned on this session, even though I knew some of it already. It's such a great thing to be reminded of how well it can help us to engage with people to make sure we're meeting the needs of everyone in the room different learning styles different thinking styles and I love it I I am slightly obsessed with it I love the thing that I've just written down and I've kind of circled it and I am also going to show you on the show notes what I've actually drawn as we've gone through it. it is the damn method as I'm now calling it the draw accept and move on And one of the things I'm really thinking about is not just around drawing and graphics, but how we can help ourselves to get out of the work gloom situation sometimes if we change that draw to speak or to listen and accept and to move on and to really use that method beyond drawing. So that's a thought that I'm going to take with me and explore a little bit more. I also love the idea that we can practice some of this stuff and do things differently, change our perspective, turn a notepad around, start in the middle, do different things to help our brain think in a different way, to give us more perspective and potentially there to give us more joy. And that by practicing these things, we can really help ourselves to understand that it's not all about being perfect and that sometimes it is, in fact, most of the time I find it, the bits of imperfection where we really um, let our guard down, where we're really humble about things we're really vulnerable is where we really make amazing connections with other people where we break down some of those barriers where we get into it together so so many things to take away from here um pushing yourself out of your comfort zone giving it a go i encourage you all to try it i am i personally really love it and i'm gonna remember in my own head to do it more because it is a great tool to work with I really hope you enjoyed this episode of the Work Joy Jam. Do head over to our socials on Instagram, on LinkedIn, on Twitter and on Facebook. We're at Create Work Joy to follow us and find out more, see who else is coming on the podcast. There are many episodes, a series one, series two are fully out there and series three coming out um, to you now as well. If you are interested in getting under the skin of some of your work joy and really creating and cultivating it for yourself, do have a look at my work joy way coaching program. It's 16 weeks. It's a combination of one-to-ones with me, group sessions and solo experiments that can really help you to transition in your career, to know what it is you want to do, to really harness and be great at work. Whatever it is, wherever you are, wherever you work, it could be the right program for you. So do go and have a look on the website www.createworkjoy.com. We also have Club Work Joy, um, a group of amazing people who are all trying to create and cultivate more joy in their working life, where we collaborate, there's events, there's networking. And again, you can find out more information on the website. Thank you for listening today. I really hope you enjoyed it. Do pop your thoughts um, into some comments on some of the socials or onto a review on the podcast. That would be great. And I hope that you'll listen again soon. See you later.